Hello, everyone. I'm Barbara Corcoran, Vice President of Education at the New York Botanical Garden. It's a pleasure to welcome you to this third talk in the Humanities Institute series, The Food Dialogues, Reclaiming Cultural Heritage Through Food, generously funded by the Mellon Foundation. What a treat it is for me to present today's guests, Juan Diaz, Maricel Precia, and our distinguished moderator, Dr. Jessica B. Harris. Broadly speaking, this series is about food waste, the cultural, historical, and social traditions that surround food. We have been looking at what we eat, how it gets to us, who prepares it, who's at the table, and more. And we've just been seeing how food can lead us to stories of survival, celebration, and identity. Our dialogue today with Von Diaz and Marisa Lucia will focus on the foods of Latin America, including the Spanish-speaking Caribbean. And now I'd like to say just a few words about our moderator. Dr. Harris has helped NYBG curate all of these conversations. And what I've loved most about working with Jessica is that she knows everyone and is very generous and committed to shaping the series. Our first conversations have been on African-American foods. Today, we widen the lens. Jessica Harris is a celebrated culinary historian, a professor, a globe-trotting speaker, and a prolific author. Last year, she received the James Beard Lifetime Achievement Award for her rich body of work, which to quote the Beard Foundation, has had a positive and long-lasting impact on the way we eat, cook, and think about food in America. She is having a special moment right now since her 12th book, High on the Hog, How African-American Cuisine Transformed America, is the inspiration of a new four-part series on Netflix. No doubt many of you have seen it. If not, I recommend you check it out. We at The Garden feel very honored to have Dr. Harris moderate the Food Dialogues. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Jessica B. Harris. Thank you, Barbara. <laughs> Good morning. This morning, I'm going to be very, very brief and simply say that I am delighted it, this, our final food dialogue for this season, to be here with two women who are not just food historians, but friends and friends of long and relatively new standing. Dr. Maricel Precia and I have been friends for decades, and I continue to be in awe of her work and particularly the scope of her work. A James Beard award-winning author, culinary historian, chef, and restaurateur, Dr. Precia is widely recognized as an expert on Latin American cuisines, cacao, and chocolate. She has pursued major research in agriculture with an emphasis on tropical staple crops besides cacao. And most recently, she's been working on mangoes. In 2013, her magnum opus, Gran Cocina Latina, The Food of Latin America, was honored as Cookbook of the Year by the James Beard Foundation and Best General Cookbook by the International Association of Culinary Professionals. But Maricel is more than a cookbook author. She was named James Beard Foundation's Best Chef Mid-Atlantic Region for 2012 for her work at her restaurant, Cuchara Mama. And she is the first Latin American woman to win this honor in the entire region. She was inducted in the prestigious James Beard Foundation cadre of US food professionals, who's who in food and beverage in America in 2015. And among her and only among her important recognitions, and this is a big one, Dr. Brescia was the first Latin American female chef to have been invited to cook an entire Latin American menu at the White House for Hispanic Heritage Month in 2009. Some of her books include an uh, encyclopedic horticultural and culinary compendium on Latin American Peppers, Peppers of the Americas, Remarkable Capsicums, The Forever Changed Flavor, which was also a prize winner, the winner of the 2018 Reference and Technical Category Award of the International Association of Culinary Professionals. 
Maricel is a descendant of cacao farmers from the Eastern mountains of her native Cuba. And she has been working on fine cacao and chocolate for the last 30 years. Her seminal book in that field, The New Taste of Chocolate, A Cultural and Natural History of Chocolate with Recipes was originally published in 2000 and a revised and expanded version was published in 2009. She continues to educate, support, and energize cacao farmers and small chocolate makers in Latin America and around the world. With her platform as founder and American director, America's director of the International Chocolate Awards, which began in 2011, and the Institute, the, the, what, the International Institute of Chocolate and Cacao Tasting. Dr. Brescia is a board member of the Fine Chocolate Industry Association, actively engaged in the organization's educational program. The Smithsonian Museum of American History's Kitchen Cabinet, and she is a member of the Culinary Institute of America's African Culinary Advisory Council. That is Dr. Presilla, but along with Dr. Presilla, we have Von Diaz, who is a more recent friend, but who is on her way to being equally celebrated. Von Diaz is a writer, documentary producer, and the author of Coconuts and Collards, Recipes and Stories from Puerto Rico to the Deep South. Born in Puerto Rico and raised in Atlanta, Georgia, her work explores food, culture, and identity. Her forthcoming book, Islas, Cuisines of Resilience, which is scheduled for publication by Chronicle Books in 2023, looks at tropical island cuisines around the globe and the ways they are connected through their use of ancestral cooking techniques. Her work has been featured in the New York Times, the Washington Post, NPR, StoryCorps, Food and Wine Magazine, and Bon Appetit, among others. In addition, she teaches food studies and oral history at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. And she currently sits on the board of directors for the Center for Documentary Studies at Duke University and is a member of the journalism committee for the James Beard Foundation. Now, these bios are not the complete bios, but the complete bios of these extraordinarily illustrious women are in the NYBG information online. So please look them up and then you will know, as we say, who's in the house. So as we start, because you come to food and you are from food and we all know each other, so this is really gonna be almost like a girlfriend's chat. Um, how do you define yourself? And Maricel, could you start? How do you define yourself with all of those things? Well, first of all, good morning, Jessica. Uh, I'm so happy to be with you and, and Vaughn and Barbara uh, on a program organized by my favorite botanical garden uh, in the world. It's such a treat. Uh, you know me. You know, we have been friends for decades. And, and you know that I am very much like you. I, I wear um, many hats. But essentially, you know, I'm looking very closely at my life uh, in the past 30 years. Um, I have decided to call myself uh, a food explorer uh, and not an armchair food explorer, mind you, although I have done my share of sitting in, in libraries and, and archives uh, all over the world. Um, but a food explorer that gets inspiration from traveling, from going to the source. For me, it's, it's very important. Um, and I think that I I've been driven by my, my work as a cultural anthropologist, as you know, in NYU, besides you know, getting my PhD in medieval Spanish history, I also work on cultural anthropology, West Africa, the diaspora, the African diaspora uh, in Latin America. But, but I need to go to the source. Um, but I have the rigor of an academic and the curiosity of an anthropologist. I think that I have been able to combine you know, everything that made me into this lifelong exploration of food. Okay, thank you. And Vaughn, the same question for you because you do similar things, but differently. Thank you, Jessica. Um, I wanna echo what Maricel um, said about 
just what a tremendous honor it is to be here with y'all this morning. Um, I also wanna add to that, what a tremendous honor it is to be in this room with two trailblazers. Um, Maricel, your recipes are ones that have taught me how to cook differently. Jessica, you already know, I, I teach your work in my classes. I'm just, um, you're both so remarkable to me and I feel really truly honored to be here. Um, how, do I, how do I define myself? Um, I think um, lately, um, as, a, as a daughter, as a sister, um, I um, identify as equally as, as Puerto Rican, as Puerto Ricana, and as Southern. Um, those are the two places, the two identities that um, live sort of in equal power in my, in my spirit and in my body. Um, and, then, and then in work, um, I'm a documentarian, much like Maricel. Um, I, I, I like to wander in order to learn. Um, I like to eat in order to learn. Um, and as an oral, um, as a documentarian, I have focused a lot of my work on, on oral histories. Um, I think the human voice is one of the most remarkable and revealing um, aspects of, of human beings. Um, and we can learn so much from one another simply by listening to each other's stories and asking the right questions, which sometimes are things like, how come? or why, you know, just really simple things. Um, I am also a writer and a storyteller and um, a burgeoning cultural anthropologist. I have a lot, I have a long way to go to reach um, the, the, the level that, that Dr. Precia has. Um, and, and finally, I'm a, I'm a cook. Um, I tend to push away the term chef and a lot of people like to call me a chef, um, but I'm happy being on the ground with, with the rest of the cooks. I was taught by my grandmother and my mother more recently by YouTube and by cookbooks. Um, and I'm good, I'm good being a cook. Um, I'm a home cook. Um, I try to make simple food that celebrates, you know, both of my cultures and, and the place that I'm from. So thank you. It's, it's really a pleasure to be here. Thank you. And Vaughn, I'm going to give you a follow-up question because you combine something that has always intrigued me, um, being Puerto Rican and Southern. How does that work in your life? I know coconuts and collards kinds of sums it up, but how does that play out? Yes, so um, my first cookbook, Coconuts and Collards, was really, um, I think, my, my sort of first attempt to use memoir and storytelling and personal history to explore the ways in which these two places that, that formed my life and identity have a lot in common and are in conversation and concert with one another. Um, you know, the, um, the South is really the place where I lived the longest in my life. I was born in Puerto Rico, but my family, uh, my father joined the military and we lived in Georgia for most of my life. And I believe that it's actually being of the South that helped me understand the Caribbean differently. Um, because when you are of the South, when you grow up in a place like Georgia, um, I often tell people, I mean, when I was a kid, they would take us to on field trips to plantations, right? And and so often on these journeys, they would um, overlook the, the enslaved. And so I came to the world with this really um, a this this really deep exploration of the the role of of the Atlantic slave trade, um, the influence of African people and cuisines on the South, and then looked back to the place where I was from. And, and saw so much synergy there and, and came to understand the tremendous influence that the Atlantic slave trade had on the entire world, the ways in which the West as we know it are defined by colonization, um, by plantation economies. And, um, and that helped me see more, more closely how African Puerto Rican cuisine is and how African Southern cuisine is. And so Puerto Rico has since become sort of um, Puerto Rico is the place where I spring from, right? It's my, it's sort of my center of understanding of the world as the place where I'm from. But within it, the South creeps in, right? Because as, as some scholars have suggested, Puerto Rico and the Caribbean should perhaps be considered part of the global South, right? We, the amount of exchange that happened between those islands and the mainland um, is, is really remarkable and, and defined the United States as we know it. Thank you for that question, Jessica. No, no, thank you for the answer, because now, rather than go to the question I was going to go to, I'm going to jump to you, Maricel. And I know that you were born in Cuba, so how does that inflect with where you are and where you live now? And I know that the reasons are very different, but could you talk a little bit about that, please? 
like like bone, I I relate uh, strongly to the to the place of my birth, but um, it inflects so much of my cooking and the way I dance, the way I speak, the way I see the world. But um, when I arrived uh, in the United States, penniless as a Cuban exile, I realized that I was not just an islander, but that I was a member of a larger construct, Latin America. And it came from contact with people from all over our America. And uh, that realization enriched me. And actually, it turned me into a militant. I am a crusader for all things Latin America. And um, it, my work in Latin America is the foundation for everything I do in my life. OK, so how does it show up in what you do? In what I do? Well, it, it, it always had a strong part uh, in, in, what I, in what I have done and, and do now. Even when I was a medievalist and I was teaching medieval history uh, at New York University and, and at Rutgers, where I created courses on, uh, on food, it showed in everything I did. Even as a, as, a, as a professor of history, I was doing medieval banquets and I was cooking and I was being gregarious as a good Cuban, as a good, as a good Latin, and my students really appreciated it. But, but the thing is that um, when uh, I had to make a decision about the rest of my life, which I'm still figuring out, um, <laughs> I, you know, I decided that I didn't want to be in a, in a classroom, that I, want, that I love teaching, uh, and, I, and I still do, but I shifted to food, and I shifted to food because of Latin America. I was given the opportunity to write this gigantic book, Gran Cocina Latina. I had a very demanding editor, Maria Guarnaschelli, uh, who gave me you know, great latitude in terms of you know, the length of the book and the time that I spent working on it. But what I did is that I started traveling through Latin America uh, and I left the ac academics. I went to every single country in Latin America and not once, many, many times. And that was the foundation, the field work that fed everything else that I have done. From my work as a chef in, in my restaurant, Safra and Cucharamama, I owned them for 20 years. They gave me great, uh, great pleasure um, and, and accolades. And unfortunately, I had to close them uh, last July because of, because of the pandemic. Um, I'm still licking my wounds and, and mourning, but um, I'm very grateful because um, everything that I learned about cooking in Latin America from hands-on experience as a chef, working with men and women all over, from the Amazon to the Andes, just about everywhere, um, I put into practice in my, in my restaurants. So everything, my restaurants were fed by my field work. Um, even all the books that I've written, you know, were nurtured by an, a very close understanding of the places of origin. For example, I wrote um, a series of illustrated books for Henry Holt uh, on the women of Lake Pátzcuaro, on the Puna Indians of Panama, on, you know, on the Hispanic Caribbean. Um, there was a personal component in those books because I had been to all those places. Uh, even my latest book, Peppers of the Americas, um, you know, was informed by what I learned about capsicums uh, all over the Americas, but also combining my love of horticulture, which is very strong. Uh, I'm a great, I think I am a great gardener <laughs> because um, I managed, you know, I took seeds, which I'm not allowed to say, but I took seeds, I planted in my garden. I learned how to nurture a pepper garden. Um, and every one of the peppers featured in that book, which were beautifully photographed by a Cuban-born photographer, Romulo Yanes, who died very recently, and I'm still mourning him, um, were grown by me in the garden. So uh, up to a, from 2002 up to the point that, I, that those peppers were photographed, um, I had grown about 300 cultivars in my tiny New Jersey garden. But everything had to do with my uh, attachment and understanding of the geographical uh, Latin America. 
Thank you. Vaughn, just as a question for you to follow up on that, you've talked a little bit about the linkage and the way that Puerto Rico inflects how you are Southern and how Georgia really inflects how you are Caribbean. How does it turn up in your work? Um, so as I said a moment ago, you know, Puerto Rico, as much the South and Puerto Rico are both my points of origin. And so I understand increasingly, particularly in this research that I'm doing around tropical islands, Puerto Rico has become my point of origin, right? I've come to understand the world in terms of Puerto Rico's history and the things that were done to that place. And similar to what Maricel said a moment ago, um, it shows up everywhere in my work. Um, one, one specific example, I mean, it shows up in the ingredients I keep in my house. It shows up in the types of things that I wanna eat. But in specifically in my work, I'm always deeply interested in, in, in Latinx people, um, in, um, in, in Latinos and Caribbeans. I find that I, um, I tend to gravitate towards them in the kinds of stories that I wanna tell. And, um, and then as a professor, one, one specific example is I teach a course called Food and American Culture at UNC Chapel Hill. It's a huge class, it's 80 students. And um, uh, it's a pleasure to teach because it's, it's largely a history class. So we start pre-Columbian and move into the modern era. And um, what I found very quickly, I was like, I need to teach two whole weeks on American territories because so often people don't know what, what the territories are. Um, just this morning, I watched the, the opening um, Parade of Nations for the, the Olympics. I was just curious. I've wa always watched it as a child and watched Guam's, um, you know, um, uh, Guam parade in. And, um, and it was like, people don't, you know, people don't know very much about Guam, at least in the United States. So that's one of the ways that, that Latin America consistently shows up is that I'm, 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 I'm interested, um, arguably obsessed with the region as a whole, um, with the cultural hybridity of, of um, Latino cultures, of Latin American cultures. Um, and then uh, in, in the work I do around food, um, every single dish tells some kind of story, right? The ingredients that are used, the techniques that are used um, often point to ancestry, often point to what grows in a place, but just as often they point to colonization, um, uh, you know, um, government policies, um, trade regulations, environmental vulnerability, right? And so, um, you know, in places like the Caribbean that get battered by storms literally every year, um, people cook and eat in a way that that also references that environmental vulnerability. And um, one last thing that I wanted to mention that I'm noticing as well is that I think that that people overlook how often um, other colonized peoples will end up in the places that the colonizer um, went to, right? So I'm, I'm studying, for example, um, in Guam, it, there's so much exchange between um, Spanish, American, indigenous, and then Asian communities in that area um, based in part um, because of, of who colonized them. So those are a few ways that it shows up in my work. Interesting, interesting. And Marisa, with the cacao, with the chefing, with all of it, we talk about how it shows up in your work. We've talked about how it shows up in your work. Anything you want to add, and particularly in the sense of specific examples? Well, I mean, that's a good example. My work with cacao and chocolate is an example of how Cuba in a way shaped me, because uh, I am a descendant of cacao farmers from Eastern Cuba. Uh, they're very humble people. Um, uh, the settlement was founded by my great great uh, from, uh, father, um, who came from Spain originally, but create, you know, created a, a Cuban family. Um, and I know the place intimately. That's where I first uh, tasted cacao as a fruit, and I was hooked for life. So anything that I do with cacao and chocolate has that point of reference that I understand sustainable cacao production in small farm uh, in Eastern Cuba. I understand how my family grew cacao sustainably. And that's a lesson uh, that I took with me everywhere I went. Um, and I took it very seriously. Um, you know, I, I have a way of being able to compartmentalize, you know, my aspects of my life. So I have been working on cacao and chocolate for 30 years. Um, and hands on, hands on. Um, I started 
uh, work in Venezuela in the 80s and 90s, 80s and 90s, uh, working with small farmers, helping you know, big companies like El Rey uh, introduce their products here in the United States. Um, and that led me to create my own company, Gran Cacao. So sourcing cacao and, and creating partnerships with farmers in Venezuela and helping them market their cacao at better prices through direct trade. Uh, and in fact, um, I basically spearheaded the movement of single origin uh, way back. Uh, when I was working in Venezuela. And from that, you know, it just, that grew, Gran Cacao grew. Um, I created, I, uh, with two partners from Europe, um, the International Chocolate Awards, which is the largest chocolate competition in the world. We have about 13 regional competitions around the world in a world final. We get thousands of samples. And I, I focus on the Americas. I'm the one handling the Americas competition, which is our largest. And let me tell you, that was quite an ordeal um, this uh, last year and because of the pandemic. So we did it, you know, with digital judging and we sent, um, we sent samples to judges all over the world that had to be processed here. Uh, and I received the packages at home. I, I cannot tell you what that was, but every single competition has been done that way. It was successful. Um, and if you have a chance, uh, to look at the link, you can see the list of winners for all our world competitions. But look at the Americas and look at the world final competition this year, and you'll see. It. I mean, the winner is a Peruvian company called Cacao Studio. The winner, you know, among the best chocolate makers in the world uh, from Peru using a cacao from Cusco grown by indigenous people. So in a way, my, my work in Latin America has taken me everywhere. Um, and I have worked uh, with descendants of, you know, uh, of Africans who were taken to work in the cacao plantations of Venezuela, uh, the same, you know, in Esmeraldas, in, in, in Ecuador, uh, Malagasy, um, descendants in, in Piura, in, in Peru, uh, indigenous people from the Amazon. So it's been absolutely enriching, but everything, and I shouldn't be saying this because this is an international competition and cacao now grows everywhere. It grows in Africa, it grows in Asia, but Latin America is the place of origin of cacao. And uh, you know, the cradle of, of, of chocolate is Mesoamerica. And I'm very proud of it. And I'm proud of the work that Latin American farmers are doing in small farms cultivating the finest cacao in the world. Wow. Okay. Um, I have a question about that that I was coming to me as you were speaking. How do you judge? What are the criteria on which the judging is done? Well, it is extremely complex. And right now we have a, a, a full uh, digital system I have a very smart partner in the UK, Martin Christie, who's a Greek, you know, a computer expert. So we have a, a digital system that has allowed our judges to get samples. They are number. There are no there are no descriptions of who made the mm -hmm. chocolate. You get the small sample, and then using this very complex uh, system that manages subjectivity in a number of questions. Um, you taste and you answer a number of questions that are, you know, that range in complexity to the point where every judge uh, actually creates a sensory map of the sample. You know, we have we have a map, and uh, according to how you taste, the intensity of flavors, you, you know, you mark the flavor points and give them a. Um, gave them a number according to intensity. So at the end, you get a complete picture of the sample. And it takes about, it takes me about 10 minutes per sample. So imagine when you get a thousand, you get 3,000. I mean, it's quite an undertaking, but it's the most enlightening uh, system that I have ever seen. And actually, you know, if you're curious, you can go back to our uh, website to learn about it. But the thing is that um, through the training that we also offer uh, in the Institute, 
which is the one that manages actually the awards, the International Institute of Chocolate and Cacao Tasting. We have thousands of students all over the world, and lots of them in Asia, in Taiwan particularly. Um, you can actually become uh, a professional taster uh, and you come with that experience and then you can become a judge of these competitions. And um, I feel it's, you know, it's the best way to learn about quality. You, know, you learn how to taste, then you put that into practice by tasting hundreds of samples at your leisure in this particular case. Wow. Did that answer the question? Yeah, yeah, no, well, you should, yes. you should be a judge uh, this year, by the way, uh, yeah, end I, of the year. I'd have to take the- Actually, you and Vaughn would be fantastic doing this. You have to take the- And you don't have to do the whole thing. You could do, you could do um, I mean, you can choose some sessions uh, and limit the number of samples you taste. That sounds like a to-be-continued discussion. But the thing that's fascinating is, again, um, we're coming back around to travel and to different parts of the world and things. And you both said earlier, you used two terms in defining yourselves that I probably fit into as well, and I love them, and I'd like to explore them a little bit more. Maricel, you've referred to yourself as a food explorer, and Vaughn, you referred to yourself as a wanderer. Why do you think and how do you think that works? I'm going to start with Vaughn and come back with you, Marisa. So Vaughn, how, how did you become a wanderer and how does that work for you? Um, well, I'm a Sagittarius, and so we'll just start there that I have a wandering spirit. Um, you know, as, as long as I can remember being on this planet, I was very curious about other places. And, and I do think that, you know, this is maybe something that resonates with a lot of, um, of, of immigrants in general, that when you when you have a point of origin and then you move somewhere else, you and you go back and forth, you see a lot of contrast, right? Like you learn from each place. Um, you know, I'm growing up in the South, I'm eating, you know, like grits and, and, and sausage and biscuits with gravy and stuff. And then going back to Puerto Rico and eating like super, super richly flavored food with pork and sofrito. So um, from a very young age, I became curious about that dichotomy. And then I just kept wanting to travel. Um, and, and the thing that I found, which I think began just going back and forth between Puerto Rico and, um, and Georgia, was, um, was that I was exploring and experiencing the cultures through the flavors. Um, I was just reminiscing the other day about being uh, moments when I was a, a kid and I would be getting ready to, to get on the plane to go to Puerto Rico to see my, to see my abuela, Tata. And, um, and I would be like salivating, thinking about eating, you know, like bacalaitos, like fried cod fritters. And the thing I was most excited about doing in Puerto Rico was eating. <laughs> and, and I would, and I would, I mean, and this is as long, again, as long as I can remember. And that impulse and that impetus has carried me to a lot of different places. Um, I'm very fortunate to have, to have traveled quite a bit. Um, I will be, um, you know, um, traveling quite a bit for this book project that I'm working on. And there's just, you know, as I said a moment ago, every dish has just layers of history and storytelling in all of its sort of complexities. Even the most simple dish can tell you a lot about a place. And, um, and if you're a lover of food, the experience of eating something and thinking about what it's telling you is just incredibly, it's just something that's really enriched my life and, and brings me a lot of joy. Um, and, and the last thing I'll say is that by eating the foods of different places, you begin to taste the similarities between places, right? So you might not actually know how the cultures and the history intersect, but you can taste it. Right, you can be like, this reminds me of this dish. Um, one of my signature dishes from coconuts and collards was a coconut braised collard dish, um, which is so much like kalalu, right? Um, which is not something I grew up eating, but the flavors tell me a lot. So yes, I feel I feel very fortunate to get to travel the world through food. Okay, um, Maricel, the same question for you. Well, I am more of a deliberate uh, traveler. Um, I think it's because of my academic. Uh, background, so I uh, I have a you know a, a focus, and I have uh, you know I'm pro I'm project driven, um, and I have a system, but I'm no less wide eyed, enthusiastic, and and food is is the key. Um, and why do I travel besides doing it for cacao and working with farming uh, institutions like cooperatives and um, sustainable farmers? 
I go to learn about food and to learn how to cook in a certain way. So for that, you have to plan. So I spend a lot of time with cooks and I, I mean cooks generally because I have cooked with men and women, although I've spent more time with women cooks, um, learning everything about it, everything about their, um, their food waste, you know, the way they, they shop for food or if they're farmers, how they grow food. And then every step of the way in the in a kitchen, looking at ingredients and ways of preparing food uh, or preserving food or fermenting food. Because I have to bring the clearest information back to my American kitchen to make the transition. So I have to understand the playbook profile, you know, of, of various preparations, because I need to recreate that in my kitchen. And that's very serious work. So I photograph, I, I taught myself how to, you know, photograph food well. I record, I do videotaping. So I have a complete picture of communities and, and households, the way they prepare food. I go to markets, spend a lot of time in markets or in the fields, even working with the women. I've been in Lake Titicaca helping women uh, freeze dry potatoes. But I need to understand that smell, that flavor, because I need to go home to Weehawken, New Jersey. I need to source those ingredients. I have to start cooking. And I have to produce recipes that have the storytelling part, which is for me, it's very important. And you know, my recipes are very long. Um, you know, there are personal stories to be told. There, there's a lot of information about particular ingredients that you need to, um, to tell well. And then you have to have recipes that work. My editor, Maria Guarnaschelli, as you know her, um, she demanded, she allowed me to be as narrative as I wanted, to have head notes that were as long as I wanted, as long as my recipes had every single detail that she demanded of me. And I it served me well, because that's the way I write recipes. So every detail, you know, every, you know, I measured everything, I weighed everything. Um, I, I told people what to expect from the transformation of food in the pot. I had to take people by the hand because my audience, let's, let's face it, it's an Anglo audience, the people who are buying these books. So I had to translate foreign experience to them in the best way possible. So for that, I had to travel in an organized fashion. Um, and I am, am thorough. That's you know, a problem. It took me a long time to go to these different countries and not just one city or to interview the best chef, but to go, for example, if I go to Peru, yes, I know the best chefs in Lima. They're friends of mine. But I also know very well, let's say, San Martin in the Amazon. And I have spent a lot of time there. I have gone back time and again to understand the cooking of that region or the Andes um, and, uh, or the Orinoco uh, in, in Venezuela. So, um, so it, it is a lot of work. And then I've spent time in archives and libraries bringing that historical foundation that is important in my recipes. Because, you know, let's face it, I am a medievalist. I am a food historian. So that has to be translated into my recipes. My head notes have to have history. Yes, they have the personal anecdotes of the people that I have met fascinating people in general. And you can see it in, in, in Gran Cocina Latina and in everything that I write, there's a personal component where there is a family recipe that I learned from my aunts uh, or my father. But um, so there is this method, you know, to this wandering. I also wonder, by the way, Bon, you know, when I go to a place, I can get lost uh, and I can, you know, but I, I go with, a, you know, very precise, plan. Otherwise, I would not have been able to do it. And I have spent years doing this. And going back to the kitchen is another journey. You know, how you uh, translate Latin American food for um, North American and, you know, English speaking readers. You know, I know that there are many Latin Americans who read me, but then I have U.S. readers who want to hear my translation uh, of this of cooking methods, where to get ingredients, how to how to peel yuca, 
how to build yucca, how to build a planting, something as basic as that. Uh, if I give a recipe for tamales using fresh corn as we do in Cuba, well, what kind of corn? Um, you know, how many ears of corn you need to have a cup of freshly, you know, uh, shop kernels. I mean, there is a lot of detail involved and that is very rigorous work. Uh, and it took me a long time, you know, to get those recipes the way my editor wanted. And looking back, when I read Gran Cocina now, I am very happy, very pleased that she was as demanding as she was with me. It was my university. <laughs> Wonderful, wonderful. And Vaughn, we've talked about it a little bit, and I know both of you and I have talked about it a bit before, long before these conversations. But when you start talking about bringing a recipe from one culture to another culture, we get into that term today, appropriation. How do we deal with that? How do you deal with it? I'm going to start with Vaughn to give you a minute to take a breath, Maricel, and then get back to you on that. How do you define it? How do you deal with it? How do you see it as a problem or do you see it as a problem? Um, this is such a layered topic. And, um, and I think I sometimes differ from my, from my colleagues and my, my attitudes around appropriation um, because they're twofold. You know, um, on the one hand, I think that um, communities of color and immigrant communities, I don't think I know. Um, have defined American cuisine as we know it. And so rarely up until I would say very recently have the people from those communities, have the cooks and the chefs from those communities been credited with that work, with the influence of that work um, and have rarely been the ones producing the recipes that we read. Um, this is a conversation I had for Museum of Food and Drink just a, a few weeks ago with Daniela Galarza from Washington Post and um, Alejandra Ramos from, from the Today Show that um, a, so often, right, uh, uh, specifically like a, a white cook, a white recipe developer can make whatever they want, right? And, and so often we'll get, um, we'll get credit over a person who comes from that community. Um, and I think there's a real problem with that. Um, I also think that like, por ejemplo, um, I, I'm, I'm Puerto Rican. One of my favorite things to cook is, is tacos. You know, like I make a tremendous amount of tacos in my house. Um, shouldn't I be able to make tacos, right? Like, do I only get have to make Puerto Rican food? Um, but that's, that's another, um, that's another trail. Um, but the, the second thing I think, which, which is really important to me, is that I have absolutely zero, less than zero issues with people cooking the foods of other places and celebrating the foods of other places. Um, recipes cannot be copywritten. They are living documents. They are part of a living cuisine. And, um, and I, I don't take any issue with people traveling a lot. Juan, did we lose you? Marisa? Yeah, I, I can, but I see the frozen image. <laughs> yeah, I think we lost Vaughn for a minute. So if, if you could answer that question as well, and then we'll get back to Vaughn when she gets back to us. Well, I, I don't have any problems with, uh, you know, people cooking the food of my country or, or you know, of Latin, or Latin America. Well, I don't have a problem personally because I am a champion for Latin American cooking and cooks. So I am very careful in my recipes to give, to give full credit every time. Uh, being Cuban doesn't give me the right, you know, doesn't give me a passport, you know, for all of Latin America. So I have to win it and win it by respect and admiration. And, <laughs> and if, you, if you look at my books, you realize that the, my greatest pleasure is to identify the origin of the recipe. Because as, as Bon said, very wisely, they are living documents. What we're leaving for the for future historians of food to look back, you know. So I believe that my work is a document. So I give as much information as I can provide about who gave me the recipe. Um, you know, if I am in a particular community, I talk about the life of the community, nurturing that particular recipe. So I don't have a problem. And um, when I uh, decided to you know, to become a hands-on chef and open restaurants. Actually, I have to tell you, my restaurants paid the bill for all that research, all that field work. At, 
at the same time, they were nourished by it. So it was a great win-win situation. Um, but I had to create restaurants that represented Latin America. I started with Safra and it was uh, Cuban Latino because I had Cuban recipes, but also had Latin American recipes. And then it was followed by Cucharamama, which was South American because we were too close. And I didn't want one restaurant to cannibalize the other. You know, the other. But I, I did not create theme parks, but I created uh, restaurants that really exemplified the best artisanal uh, cooking of broad parts of the Americas. But I did it so respectfully. And in fact, I even, you know, when I learned a recipe from someone that I used in my own menus, I gave the name of the person who gave me the recipe. I okay. knew it. Uh, my recipe. So I feel that the question of appropriation, which is alive and well, and it's the topic that deserves a whole panel, um, does not apply to me. You know, I want you to cook my food, Jessica. I, I really do. <laughs> and I do. Yvonne, we lost you in the middle of your comments so do you yes, have anything so sorry. to add my, my my internet um went out no i think the the last thing and i i echo what i what i just heard maricel say that um you know i think that the, the, the question of cultural appropriation is one of power and, and representation. And, um, and, and at the same time, because cuisines are alive, we, we have to be careful, right? That, that, that the message is not, um, you know, only cook the things that are of the places that you're from, right? That doesn't, um, that doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't feel like, um, it doesn't feel like you're living in a, in a, in, in a global culture, right? Which we do at this point. Um, and, and so I, I really celebrate um, people who want to take the time to get to know a cuisine, who want to get to know the ingredients, who, who pick up, you know, Maricel's book and learn all about Latin America and the complexities, who perhaps adopt some ingredients that they've never used. Um, and, and through the process of cooking through these recipes, learn about the place. That, that, that makes me, um, that's the kind of world I want to live in. Um, and at the same time, we have a lot of work to do, you know, because totally as I started, empowering, empowering the cooks of our community, which absolutely. I felt I, I was doing through my work. And, and I believe that there is a lot to be done through respect, acknowledgement. Right. Good. Absolutely. It, we are coming to the end of our time. So I have two last questions for each of you. One, what is, you both storytellers, you both are brilliant storytellers. What is the most memorable brief story that occurred to you in your food wanderings in the Latin American world? Just briefly, Vaughn, you are a registered proclaimed storyteller. I'm gonna start with you and then I'll get to you myself. So think about it. Ay, ay, ay. Um, <laughs> So, gosh, you know, the thing that is coming to mind for me um, is that I traveled to Cuba, actually, when I was 19 years old. I was, a, um, I was a college student, and I had the tremendous privilege of traveling the entire island, which is actually very rare. Most, many, most Cubans I know don't get to do that. We started in La Habana. We went all the way around. We went to Santa Clara. And I remember um, it was a late night. And I was with some colleagues and, you know, we had decided to sit at the beach and we got really hungry. And um, there was a 24 hour, um, a, a 24 hour kind of little, little tiendita, you know, like um, that had just like, you know, sodas and um, they made the most perfect cheese sandwiches that I have ever eaten in my life. And the bread was like, reminded me of pan sobao from, from Puerto Rico. It was like slightly sweet. And it was just one slice of cheese, um, like some kind of white cheese and they had popped it in the microwave. And it was just the most um, uh, sort of humble, perfect um, thing I'd ever put in my mouth. It, it I, I sort of was also like, this is something that is eaten everywhere in the world, right? When you're hungry, just like some kind of creamy thing on some really soft bread. Um, and it, um, yeah, it's one of my, my favorite early memories of just tasting something so simple that was so perfect. Thank you, and Marisa. Well, you know, uh, as, as I have been 
learning from cooks all over the Americas. You know, I can tell you that every every moment was really unforgettable. Uh, but I have to say that, you know, sometimes bringing a recipe home has been fascinating. Um, we wanted to have uh, several recipes for whole pig. Uh, you know, as Cubans, people from the Hispanic Caribbean, we love, you know, speed roasting, you know, in the backyard. So um, I decided to do that, you know. So I, you know, I work with, you know, Cuban, uh, a Cuban farmer from the central part of Cuba, you know, recreating you know, this, this whole big uh, experience. And we have, you know, digging a hole in the backyard, learning about his life. Um, you know, I, he was asking for green uh, pieces of wood, which we couldn't find. So we ended up in Home Depot, you know, <laughs> making compromises. You know, the compromises and, and what I learned about the inventiveness of this man who had been a farmer. Uh, he was of Canary Island uh, descent. Um, from Central Cuba, you know, it's a, he was in his 80s, working with me, trying to create something that someone at home here in New Jersey or anywhere in the United States could uh, duplicate. That was amazing. And another great experience was renting an island uh, in in uh, in Patagonia, in Chile, to do a curanto, yeah, a curanto, like the, the, the Chilean clam bake. I had to rent an island, rent it, essentially. And uh, it came with this, you know, fishermen who had survived that great tsunami, you know, in southern Chile, digging the hole and spending the whole day with me doing this. And then I invited people that I had just met, friends of friends of mine who had taken me there. Uh, and I was like the host, you know, on this island uh, in Valdivia, you know, doing this curando. And, and it was just an unbelievable experience. The thing is that I was supposed to be going uh, to the southern tip of Chile, and there was an Arctic storm and that was killing sheep and, and, and it disturbing everything. So I ended up having to do a curanto in Valdivia. So the only way to do it was to, you know, to rent this island. Okay. Uh, so we had to go by boat. So experiences like that, you know, abound in my book and they enrich it. But it's really hard to pinpoint just one. Well, then we'll have to settle for that. <laughs> and I understand that there's some great questions from the audience. So in one sentence, because we're running out of time, one sentence, Vaughn, future plans. Yes, I am. As um, you already know, I'm working on my next cookbook, uh, Islas Cuisines of Resilience, and as such, we'll be traveling to six small islands uh, around the world. Right now, they are the Seychelles, Madagascar, Guam, Fiji, Puerto Rico, and Curaçao. And in those places, I am using Puerto Rico as the foundation for understanding island cooking. Thank you, Marisa. Thank you. So I am taking stock. I mean, first of all, I am recovering, you know, from the, my losses, you know, but there's no time to cry right now. So I'm taking stock of everything I've done, uh, looking at my recipes and the travel experience in, in cacao countries uh, in Latin America. So I'm working on it in a cookbook based on my experiences with you know, farming communities throughout the Americas. And I'm also, I decided that I am going to do only personal projects, you know, things that resonate with me personally. Um, and I am kind of uh, on, a, on a process of reconquest when it comes to my life in Spain. You know, I lived in Spain right. as a medieval history student and my four great, uh, great -grandpa grandfathers come from Spain. So I'm retracing their steps. I'm going back to ah. their communities, learning about the food and also looking at how they created families in Cuba, marrying women of mixed racial heritage and how that worked and how they created families were also great cooks. So it would take, I would be traveling to Spain quite a bit and coming back and probably hoping to go to Cuba to close the story. So Sounds these are wonderful projects nice that are very dear to my heart at this point. So it's my reconquest. I don't know that how to sounds, the book. That sounds glorious. Yes. Ladies, clearly we could go on and on and on and on and on. And I hope to do that someday. But I'd like to throw it back to Barbara after saying thank you so very much for this uh, just fun conversation, illuminating, edifying, and informative. So Barbara has some questions that she is going to ask you. So 
Yes, well, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Jessica. Thank you, Bon and, and Marisel. I agree there's much work to be done empowering people to tell their own origin stories about food. Um, thank you both for sharing all of your great stories. There are lots of questions in the chat. It's really building up. I want to remind the audience that um, you can type your questions into the Q&A, the button at the bottom. And if you see a question that you like in the Q&A, you can actually like it with that little thumbs up button at the bottom. And those questions will automatically jump to the top as the most popular. So let's get going. Cheryl asks, our identities are so complex. As you express yours through food and storytelling, do you ever feel frustrated or misunderstood by the perceived identity others may assign to you based solely on what is visible? And how do you reconcile this? Wow. <laughs> I, it's a heavy one to start off with, but it's the number one. So. All right. So, um, <laughs> Maricel, will you take it well, briefly because we're getting ready to run out of <laughs> yes, time. Yes, uh, you know, it is a charged question. It's a wonderful question. Um, I have to say that after you know, a long quest, I, um, I had identified myself as a Latin American, but I'm also frustrated because um, as a Cuban, as a person from a particular country, I understand that people in my part of the world have this uh, atavic attachment to you know their, their little hometowns, their countries, and they don't yet understand that they're part of a larger construct. Um, I feel that we're grossly misunderstood here in this country. You know, our, our rainbow uh, quality, you know, our multicolor experience, you know, the, the, the inferences that make us, the Africanness and the Spanishness of our beings, you know, they're not truly understood. There are other issues that are cropping in the question of you know, gender identity that are happening. Um, for me, for example, to use the term Latin, Latin American to define me came after 30 years of um, search for my own identity. But it doesn't mean that I don't understand other concerns having to do with gender issues that you know, spring other, other terminology. I still think that we are uh, work in, in process. Um, for example, yesterday I, I had people working in my garden and uh, we were talking about Latinx, which I didn't want to mention, but here it is. You know, so I went out and I talked to the people working in the garden. So I wrote Latinx you know, on a piece of paper and I asked someone who had from Mexico who had been here for 18 years to read it. So he said Latinx and then he said, oh, like as in tres X in the beer. Then someone who had been here for 12 years, read it and said Latin, and she didn't know what it was. Then I have talked to college students, they know what it is. And, you know, in my own family, you know, I have, you know, you know, nieces that have um, gender uh, issues, um, they're non-binary, so they, they enjoy, they love, they found a home in Latinx. So the, the, our experience is not, easily defined by a word. I, I choose Latin America for one reason, that I don't wanna lose the Americas part. I don't wanna give it to you people in the United States, you know, because you have an impossible name, the United States of America. So, you know, we call you Estadounidenses, you know, but you call yourselves American. So we are also American, so we have to define to what part of the Americas we belong. So I choose Latin America, although I think it would be much better to say Ibero-American, but it has stopped and people don't like it very much because it's long. So the short of it is Latin, Latino, Latina, Latinx. So we are work in progress, but you know what I love about all this is that we are thinking about important issues as identity but we don't lose track of where we came from. You know, still, you know, I wanna hear more. I wanna, I wanna have more options, but we have an open conversation. So I'm not about to vilify anyone for choosing the term that best defines them, where they find a home. I have found a home in Latin America. And how about you, Vaughn? 
Um, briefly, and, and I think this came about um, as a result of the research that I'm doing on islands, something that's bothered me for some time is that the Caribbean as a region um, is very stratified, right? So people identify as West Indian, people identify as Puerto Rican, as Dominican, as Cuban. There isn't sort of a feeling of a Caribbean identity. And I think that that is, I think that that should change because I think that the colonizers of the Caribbean are the ones that imposed the attitude that we should have these separate identities, but we have so much synergy and intersection between us. And so I personally have been increasingly identifying myself as Caribbean and encouraging other folks from different parts of the Caribbean to join me in, in, in sort of decolonizing our attitudes about what a Caribbean identity might be, particularly in the 21st century. And, and I'm seeing this also as I study different parts of the world. I'm seeing similar sort of synergies in, in different oceans as well. So um, it, yes, I certainly am, am misunderstood, but I, much like Maricel, like um, it, I, I'm not losing track of where I'm from and I'm in, an incredibly inclusive person. And I think inclusivity is really important in the, you know, in, in, in the era that we're living in. Very true. Let me jump to the next one. We, we're actually a little over, so I've just asked this one, which is the most popular. Can you re recommend any historical books, archives, or other resources to learn more about recipes that combine indigenous Caribbean and West African ingredients, especially for Cuba or Puerto Rico? Well, I will take some of that and recommend certainly Maricel's El Gran Cocina Latina, uh, Latino Americana. I, no, it's, it's with, actually, you know, it was Maria's title, Jessica, Gran Cocina Latina, which I, you know, the Latina part, I wasn't sure of, but I said the food of Latin America should go in and it did. So that's what it is, is the food of, of Latin America. So, so Bev, the cuisine of the countries that were created out of the dissolution of the Iberian colonial empires, Spain, so think Portugal, asking, or the United States also, because that's where I, I live here. I live in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. I have shopped for ingredients in my local restaurant, in my local uh, markets and created this food in my kitchen. So the US is part of this um, new Latin America. People are coming from all over and there is a new Latin America without borders being created in the US. Right. Um, any other books you can think of? Vaughn, I'm going to ask you. Certainly yours, Coconuts and Collards as well. Um, but a book that, that then gives us a little bit of, of overarching background of the braid and the threads and the, the mixings was part of the question, mm -hmm. if I understood yes, the question that's correctly. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think that that makes the situation a little more complex because one of the things that has happened is things tend to be somewhat balkanized in the sense of you can have maybe a book that talks about that for a particular country or another country, but an overarching book that talks about the region is harder to find, which is why I recommended Maricel's book so automatically. Um, I think that's pretty, that's certainly the best I can do. Well, and also do, you know, do research and essentially read as much as you can. Uh, you might not find the, the silver bullet here, but you have to read extensively. And there, there is a lot of work being done uh, and that has been done and, and you have to do your homework too as a reader. Vaughn, do you have any? I do, a few came to mind. Um, one specifically, which I'll acknowledge is actually a little bit hard to get your hands on, um, but if you're on the island, um, you can find it in, in, in different um, librerias called um, El Buren de Lula, um, which is a cookbook that was produced um, very, very locally. It's an independent cookbook based on the cooking of, of an elder um, Puerto Rican cook who cooks in what's known as like the African heart of, of Puerto Rico and Loisa. Um, really, really important book. Um, again, it's hard to find, but, um, but El, Bu El Buren de Lula, B-U-R-E-N. Right. Um, I, I actually knew Lula. Um, yes, and she's still with us. And that's wonderful. I haven't seen her in years. The yes. question, though, becomes that's simply Puerto Rico, and we could come up with 
titles. Sure. Or, exactly. Everywhere. Yeah, definitely. Everywhere. Sure. Each well, place. I'm thinking more that it's but, a really unusual example. Oh, no, um, it's a and, wonderful and, example. And she speaks to that. Um, well, I'm glad they, to hear that people are, are interested. I mean, that's... Yeah. Uh, that's yeah. And they were asking specifically for Cuba yes. or Puerto Rico. Okay. Unfortunately, we could go on forever, as you said. Sure. Now, now over time, out of time, we are over time. So once again, I thank all of you for this great, great talk. It went the time really just flew by. Know that we plan on bringing you more food dialogues with Jessica Harris in the near future. Stay tuned. We are cooking those up now. Uh, Marie said, food explorer, crusader. We look forward to hearing all about your reconquest. And Vaughn, good luck on your new project. Looking forward to the book on the Isla's cuisine, the cuisines of the islands. Uh, it sounds like it's going to be a really fascinating journey. Thank you all very, very much. And thank to you, our Barbara. audience, thank you for your loyalty. We have enjoyed this. Thank you all. Thank See you, you so much for being with us. See you on thank the next you. one, on the next Food Dialogues.